Good morning, everyone. All right, so today we are covering uh, one proportion and two proportion problems. Uh, this first problem we have to work with, it is, uh, it's called referendum. And uh, the situation is that we've got a referendum that's placed on a local ballot. So the idea here is that if more than 60% of voters in, um, in this area favor this referendum, then it's gonna go ahead and pass. Otherwise, it's not going to pass. So a random sample of 250 registered voters was taken. We have about 100, in fact, we have not about, we have 180 saying that they are going to vote for this referendum um, in favor of it. So the main question that we have here based on the results, is there evidence to indicate the referendum will pass? Okay, so, when it comes to categorical data, right, we've got one population, which is, you know, registered voters in the area. Um, what are they, you know, what are they likely to vote for passing or not passing? And we're going to use this to try and determine if, if the true proportion of people voting for the referendum is going to be more than 60%. So that's kind of setting up our, alter, uh, our alternative hypothesis. When we have categorical data, uh, we don't, really need to import a data set because all we have is counts, right? The information that we have is, you know, in our sample of 250, we have 180 saying yes. So what I could do is code the data as a zero or a one. So what I'm going to do is say that, you know, I'm going to use a one to represent those individuals that plan on voting for the referendum. And then a zero, those are going to represent the individuals that do not plan on voting for the referendum. So a one typically represents a success, whereas a zero would represent a failure. But remember, I get to kind of decide what is a success and a failure. I kind of think that if we keep track of, you know, the proportion of people that are going to vote for the referendum, voting for the referendum, that's why I decided that was going to be the one. Okay, so the first order of business, instead of actually importing a data set, we're going to write in the data using the C function, so the concatenation. I always think this is like combined. Um, and we've used this multiple times before. Remember, we've used this when I wanted to just create a really simple data set, something like data equals C, and then I just type in the data set, and there we have it. Well, I'm pretty much doing the same thing, but we have 150 individuals in our sample. I don't want to have to type out 180 ones and then the rest zeros. So I can use the repeat function, R-E-P, to kind of speed up that whole process. So what I want to do is it doesn't really matter what order I do this in, but I'm going to use the repeat function. And the first thing in this function that I have to provide it is what do I want it to repeat? So I want to type in a one. And how many ones do I want? 180. All right, so what this part is going to do, if I'm just, I'm just going to highlight this little piece so you can see what it's doing, and I'm going to run that little tiny piece just as it is. Oh, that's 180 ones. Okay, well, now I have a comma because I want to separate the ones from the zeros. Now I'm going to do the same thing and repeat zero the remaining number of times, which would be 70, because 80 plus 70 is 250. All right, and then just to see what that's doing, that is going to give me 70 zeros. So if I wanted to combine all this in a vector, well, I got to separate those two things with the comma, and then I'm going to combine it using that C function. And so with my cursor in line 10, we're going to run, and now I have all of that data saved under the name referendum. So if I was to run only the name itself, so I'm highlighting only the name and hitting run, we can see that now I have 180 zeros and I have 70, no, what did I say? Hello, Julie. I have 180 ones and then 70 zeros. So there we have our data set. Again, no need to import this because it's pretty easy to write this in yourself just like that. 
All right, so early on um, in any type of uh, inference problem, you need to get a sense of what data do you have and explore it. So the variable of interest here is categorical, okay? Well, whenever I think about the fact I have a categorical variable of interest, I think about what is the random variable? Well, it's going to be discrete. All right. Think of a random variable as a numerical outcome from some random event. Our random event is selecting 250 voters. The numerical outcome is observing 180 of them voting for the referendum. All right, so this is discrete. And whenever I think about a discrete random variable, I think about, is this a binomial random variable? Do I have a fixed sample size? Yes, I do, 250. Does each observation have only two outcomes? Yep, it's either vote for or vote against. Uh, so two possible outcomes. It, do I have independent observations? Well, yeah. Um, because I would imagine one voter in this randomly selected set is not influencing another voter, right? Because it's random, right? I, I'm guessing they probably don't know each other. And then finally, is the proportion of success the same for all individuals or the probability of a success? And I would say, yeah, if we're randomly selecting individuals from a large population, well then, whatever this true proportion of voting for the referendum is, all right, I have that probability of selecting an individual that you know plans on voting for the referendum. So with that being said, we have a binomial random variable. Yay, life just got a little bit easier. Because right. if we had some other type of discrete random variable, I'd have to go through you know, um, either a different method or a different formula to find this p-value that we're after. Okay, so now that we are in a spot where um, we need to maybe explore the data, uh, for a categorical variable of interest, what I will be creating is a table of counts or frequency table. Uh, I can get those counts into proportions. Uh, and then I'll show you, as boring as it might be, how to construct a bar chart for this data. Okay, so just to um, remind you of what we've got going on, we do have a hypothesis test that we're setting up. So I'm just going to give myself some notes so I can stare at um, the hypotheses so that we know kind of what's happening here. So the null hypothesis, remember this is a statement of no difference, no effect, and that nothing's going to happen. And so um, we do have a parameter, which is P, the population proportion or the true proportion of people in this area that are going to vote for the referendum. Now, if I follow my own rules, I always have an equal to sign in these hypotheses, right? When I, you know, I have the structure parameter equals number. Okay, so what number am I going to use? Well, I'm going to pause there for just a second. This competing claim that we've got is that the referendum is going to pass if we get more than 60% of the votes, right? So if this really looks like my alternative, 0.6 is going to be that null value. So the null value needs to show up in the alternative and the null hypothesis, right? So those are the hypotheses that we're going to be using for this problem. Okay, so with all of that being said, we're really kind of set up now to explore the data. And so the first order of business, we need to create a table of counts. So to do that, I can use the table function. This is going to just essentially tally up everything that I've got. And so um, the table that I want is based on the referendum variable. If I can spell it correctly, there we have it. Um, and so I want a table of the referendum. Now this really should be no surprise because we wrote in the data. So uh, my cursor was in line 22. I hit run and it went ahead and saved. Well now if I want to see what I've got, I can go ahead and run the name ref tab or referendum table first um, is what that represents. All right, no surprise there. We've got 70 zeros 
and 180 ones. Now, the uh, RStudio has this function called prop.table. So what this will do is create proportions for the table that I created. Now remember a table is just a number um, in a category divided by the total. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and use this function just to make life a little easier, but when you know it comes down to it, I could easily calculate the proportions myself. All right, so this ref prop table is again just a name that I'm giving to the table of counts, um, but I added that prop so that it kind of reminds me that it's gonna be a table of proportions. So prop.table is the function I'm using, and I am going to now put in the name of the table of counts. Okay, So we'll run that. So my cursor is in line 26. I run, and then I'll run the name so that I can see what I've got. And so uh, it looks like in our sample, 72% of our sample voted for the referendum or plan on voting for the referendum, whereas 28% uh, do not. Now, if I am, let's say, in a homework assignment and I'm trying to create these proportions and I just can't seem to get it to work, right? Um, here we have the counts. You know, you can calculate the proportions by yourself if you need to, because R could be used just like a calculator. So if I have 180 divided by the total 250, all right, that's just a proportion, I can click run, and there I get the 0.72. All right, now I know that I have 70 zeros divided by 250. I can hit run, and again, I'm just using R like a calculator. So again, if you couldn't get the prop table to, to work correctly, you know, and all you needed was a couple of proportions, don't be afraid to just finding them yourself, okay? All right, so um, when it comes to categorical data, again, you know, exploring the data really is just finding counts, maybe proportions. We could find a bar chart, or create a bar chart, excuse me, I'm not really finding it, I'm creating it. And the first thing, first argument right here that I need to provide the bar plot, that's the name of the function that's going to get us our bar chart, I need to provide it a table. Okay, now I created two tables. Here is a table of counts, and here is a table of proportions. I could put either one of those into this bar plot function. So uh, let's go ahead and just use the table of proportions. And so uh, on the y-axis, again, I'll get proportions instead of actual frequencies. So I'm gonna type the name of our table, ref prop tab, okay? And then I start adding in arguments to make my graph just a little prettier, okay? Um, one of the things that I want to point out is that uh, name.arg, A-R-G. This allows me to change the name of uh, the categories instead of them by default showing up as one and zero, I can change them to what they are. Now keep in mind how R organizes itself, always numerically, always alphabetically, unless you tell it otherwise. Okay, so here in our tables, Notice that zero comes first. Okay, well, if I'm going to rewrite the names of the categories, I have to think about the fact zero is like our first group. So that's why I typed in no right there, right? Because this first argument or this first a word in the names.arg argument is going to correspond with this first category, which is a zero, and those represent the no's. Our second category here is a one, right? Because again, we're working numerically here. Um, and so that's why the second thing that I'm listing is a name for what those ones represent, and so that would be yes. Okay. 
And then I just, uh, you know, add in appropriate titles, plan on voting for the rep referendum, yes or no. So I'll go ahead and highlight all that. I'm going to hit run. Perfect. Now, the other thing that I did, just to make sure that this graph was going to show up the way that I wanted it to, is I changed the Y limit so that I had an appropriate Y axis. Because, you know what, just for, sec uh, for a second, I'm going to create a really generic bar plot. And in fact, I do this sometimes just to get a sense of what the graph looks like before I start adding in a bunch of um, extra arguments to make it pretty. I just do bar plot and then here's my table, right? My pro table of proportions. Okay, so when I run that, um, I, I kind of see, okay, down here on the x-axis, there's a zero and a one. You know, um, I can see that this bar is going right up to the very top. Um, but in fact, I might want to make this a little bit taller, right? Because I'm thinking about the fact that my proportion of yeses, 72%. So really, I should change this y-axis to maybe be zero to 0.8. Really, that's what I should have been doing, right? And so I'm going to actually rerun this now. I'm going to give those bars some color just because I like to. Um, zero and one isn't a very meaningful name, so I'm going to change this to no and this to yes. That's where that name.args is coming from. And um, I kind of like, you know, text that's a little bit bigger, so I can change the size of the text to be just a little bit bigger than default. So now I can run this newly updated bar plot with all the fun arguments in there. And look, now we've got a little bit bigger text. I can see that nicely. I have titles where they belong, and now I've changed that to no and yes. Doesn't that look much nicer? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so now we are getting into the good stuff, which is obtaining the p-value and confidence interval. Now, uh, since we have a binomial random variable, we can go ahead and use the binome.test to get the exact p-value. So this is kind of handy because, you know, instead of finding individual binomial probabilities for all of the counts, for, you know, a, a count of 180, a count of 181, 182, 183, all the way up to 250, Right, because all of those counts would be considered as or more unusual than what I observed, this binome.test is going to do all of that for us. Kind of works almost like a t.test does, you know, it does all the calculations. So the first thing that I need to provide this binome.test is the number of successes. Okay, so we had 180 for the um, number of, um, oh, what was that? The number of yeses. Thank you. I lost my train of thought there. And then I have to provide it next, the total sample size. So that was 250. All right. Next, I need to provide it the null value for the population proportion. And that would be 0.6. And then I need to provide it a type of alternative. So just like the t.test, remember how I needed to type greater or less or two dot sided? Same, same argument here. So we have an alternative. Now we wrote this down earlier. I'm going to scroll up to the top. Our alternative has that greater than symbol. Right, because remember the referendum is going to pass if we have greater than 60% voting for it. So in this argument, I'm going to type greater with double quotes around it. And then I can use the conf.level to provide uh, it my confidence level. I like 0.95. It's a pretty good tried and true confidence level. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run this and we get our output now. Check this out. We have data, so it reminds us of what data we put in, the number of successes, the number of trials, so it really reminds me, did I do that part correctly? And we have a p-value. Remember this is scientific notation, so when I see e negative 0, 0,5, it means this decimal place is going this direction five places. 
which really just tells me that is a super small p-value. Holy moly, that is small. So when we have a small p-value, I, you know, get to reject the null hypothesis. We have evidence to suggest that the true proportion of people voting for this referendum or planning on voting for ref the referendum is going to be greater than 0.6. So there's a pretty good chance that this referendum is going to pass. Now, in our class, we always do two-sided confidence intervals with a finite lower bound and a finite upper bound. Okay, And we can use the binome.test to get these bounds, but just like previous uh, previous functions, when I type in a alternative that is, you know, one-sided, in other words, greater or less, well, then the confidence interval it gives me is only going to be one-sided as well. I'm only going to really get one bound. And to be perfectly honest, this is the appropriate confidence interval for this kind of a test, um, but it's a bit awkward at uh, an introductory level. So the strategy usually at the introductory level is to always have confidence intervals that have two bounds, finite upper and lower. So what I could do is I could just, you know, essentially run the function again and type everything in, just change my alternative to two dot sided. Right, you got to be careful though, don't check out the p-value from this because it would not be the correct p-value according to our alternative. I'm just using the, the bounds of the confidence interval if I go ahead and change this. Okay, so I can run, I don't want to highlight anything, and so I get a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval that has a lower bound of about 0.66 and an upper bound of 0.77. So I'm 95% confident that the true proportion of registered voters that plan on voting for the referendum is between 0.66 and 0.77. That's how I would in interpret that. Now in class, uh, we talked about using the normal approximation. So this is a formula that utilizes um, a z-score and a, you know formula for that standard error and since our sample size is so large this normal approximation should give us bounds that are almost identical to the interval using the binomial method so let's see how close we can get now all that I've done is I've essentially typed out um, the formulas for p hat, which is our sample proportion. I have uh, typed out the formula for the standard error. So it is the square root of the quantity in the numerator p hat times 1 minus p hat. And then I divide that by our sample size. So up here at the top, all I need to do is, because I've used the word successes, a couple of times in these formulas. I need to, you know, just give that a number, 180. N, that is our sample size, so 250. So I'm going to run those two lines. My cursor is in line 55, so I hit run. And now it's in line 56, and I want to run that as well. So now I have N saved just as a number. Successes, that's also saved as a number. Now I easily could just type these numbers into the formula, right? But what fun would that be? <laughs> this looks fancier, right? <laughs> now the nice thing is that if I have this all written out, those formulas written out, let's say I'm doing another problem later on, I don't have to change line 58, 59, or 60. Really I just have to change the number of successes and number of failures and all of this is all automatically changed then. Okay, so I'm going to again define what is p hat. So I'm going to run that. I'm going to define what z score is. That's just our critical value for 95% confidence. That's 1.96. And then I'm going to define what our standard error is. And again, the standard error, this formula, is using p hat, which is just the number of successes over the total sample size. So I've defined that as well. 
So now when I go looking for my lower bound, the lower bound is just equal to p hat minus the critical value times the standard error. So since I've defined all three of those pieces, I could just run this line lower bound and then I run the name to actually see what it is, 0.664. And the upper bound, um, ooh, that's not correct. Let me correct that. There we go, because the upper bound is p hat plus z score times standard error. So I can run that and then I get an upper bound. And notice with our normal approximation, I have a confidence interval now this is the exact method, so this is the one I would use if I had a choice, but if I'm, you know, stranded on a desert island and I don't have the formulas in front of me for the binomial method, then a good old fashioned piece of paper and the uh, normal approximation is easy enough to do and I can um, get those values pretty easily. So both of those bounds tend to agree with each other. All right, so that is a problem when I only have a single categorical variable. Now we're going to move on, though, to a example where I have uh, a proportion that I'm wanting to compare between two groups. All right, so the question we have, do people working long hours have difficulty falling asleep? Uh, another way we can kind of think about this is, do people who work full time or fewer hours have less trouble going to sleep, right? So that's kind of one way to think about it. So this and other questions, they've been investigated and uh, two independent samples of British uh, civil service workers were used in this study that we're looking at. Those uh, two sets of in, uh, workers either were categorized as um, work less than or equal to 40 hours a week. And then there was a group who worked more than 40 hours a week. Okay, so we have full-time plus or um, essentially just less than full-time. Okay, so of the 952 workers that work less than or equal to 40 hours a week, 64 of them said that they had difficulty falling asleep um, and difficulty falling asleep, right, just so we can be clear about what that means, um, it means that they had difficulty falling asleep at least three times a week. Okay, because let's face it, sometimes, you know, we all toss and turn even if we're not working full time. So if you toss and turn and can't get to sleep three times a week or more, um, then you were categorized as difficulty falling asleep, right, in general. Okay, so of the almost 1,500 workers who worked more than 40 hours a week, 101 of them said that they had difficulty. Okay, so that's a lot of numbers to work through. And in this example, although it's not totally required, um, the data was saved in the work sleep data set. So I went ahead and um, before the video started, I imported that so I had it to work with, okay? And so um, if you don't have it, you know, uploaded, make sure to upload the data yourself. And so what we're going to do is use this information to determine, you know, if there's evidence that the proportion of people having difficulty going to sleep, is that different between these two working groups? Again, 40 hours or less or more than 40 hours. Okay, so uh, with every hypothesis test, we really need to uh, make sure that you have a good understanding of what the variable of interest is, what the populations are, right, and going through all of those steps. I'm going to kind of jump to the, um, the R portion of this uh, and leave you with thinking about, you know, do we have a good representative sample based on the information I provided? What's the null and alternative? Well, actually, that's a good one for us to talk about, right? Because in order to correctly perform this hypothesis test, I do need to know what is my null and what is my alternative. So just to provide some notes to myself, um, we are going to write down what the null is. Okay, so the null hypothesis, kind of hard to write here, um, is that we have a parameter equals number. 
So right now we are thinking about two populations. British workers that work 40 hours or less, and then British workers that work more than 40 hours. Okay, And we're also concerned about the proportion of people that have difficulty sleeping. Um, so um, certainly this proportion exists for the two working groups. So let's go ahead and say um, P, and I can't really do a subscript, but if I was writing this out, I would have a subscript here and um, I might do P and then the subscript is less than or equal to 40. Okay, so again, this piece, if I had my uh, choice, that would be a subscript on this P. Okay, um, that proportion minus the proportion, and again, I'm going to subscript here, greater than 40. All right, if I had, I was, if I was in front of you, I'd be writing this out, say on a piece of paper maybe. Um, so that's the difference in proportions. The difference in proportions is our parameter of interest. That is the thing that I am trying to make a generalization about. All right? We believe in a null hypothesis there would be absolutely no difference. Whereas in an alternative, okay, we're going to have, and I'm just going to do some copy pasting so I type more than I need to. The alternative is that this parameter, again the proportion of people having difficulty sleeping for those working 40 hours or less, minus this proportion of people having difficulty sleeping working more than 40 hours, we think that that is um, less than zero. Right? I picked a less than zero here because up in the initial question of interest, Right? Do people who work full-time or fewer hours have less trouble going to sleep? So we would imagine this proportion, again, the proportion of people having difficulty sleeping, we think this is a smaller number than this. Right? So that difference we believe to be negative if we go ahead and write it out this way. Okay. All right, so let's get into exploring data. So just like before, categorical data, I'm essentially looking at a table of counts, a table, uh, table of frequencies. Um, since I do have two variables here, uh, I am going to create a contingency table. In this case, it would be a two by two table because I have two categories for the variable work. Let's go ahead and check this out. Oh, excuse me. Um, uh, two variables for uh, two categories, let me say the right word here, uh, for the variable sleep. And so we can see this is defined as a factor. That's just R's name for categorical. Has two levels, or in other words, two categories. And the categories are difficulty or no difficulty. And then we have hours. Hours is that working group. It's categorical with two categories, and those two categories are less than 40. Oh, and I can't really see what the other is, so I'm going to click on this data set, and I see less than 40 and over 40 hours. So I already can tell the two types of variables that I've got to work with. All right, so starting here, what we need First is the, um, we need to use the table function again. Now remember the table function tallies up all of these variables. All right, so in this table function, I can list two variables and it is going to then create a table of counts. The first thing that I need to list is the variable that I want to be showing as our rows. Um, and that's typically the response variable and our response is the variable sleep, right? Do they have difficulty or not? So typing out the name of our data set, because now we've actually imported a data set. That's where all this information's at. So we will um, type in the name work sleep. Okay, this first variable is sleep. So again, this is the variable that's gonna make up the rows of my two by two table. Next is the variable that is going to make up the columns. And so work, work sleep 
is the name of the data set, and then hours is the name of our explanatory variable, which again is going to make up the columns. So we'll go ahead and run this line 79. All right, we've saved the table under the name, sleep table, and to view the table, just run the name. And so here we have it. Now the convenience here is that in my data set, work sleep, the categories are not zeros and ones, they're actually words. So my table is pretty meaningful um, because I have difficulty, which I can see there. Um, so those that are working less than 40 hours, difficulty having sleep, that's 64 of them. So no difficulty was would be 888 of them. All right, we've got that. Um, over 40 hour counts as well for that other group. Okay, so, uh, you know, I easily could manually on my own figure out what the proportions are for this table of counts, but R can also help me out with that. I'm still going to use the prop table, prop.table, um, and in order to use this function, I need to first provide it a table of counts. And so in this case, it would be our sleep table. Oops, not capitalized. All right, sleep underscore table. But here's the catch. When I do a prop table function, especially when I've got a two by two table to work with, there's sort of a few different ways that proportions could be counted, right? So a proportion could be the um, cell count over the grand total. I could have the cell count over the row total, which would be over here, or I could have the cell count over the column total. So I have to be very um, thoughtful as to what kind of proportion I want R to give me. Now for our problem, it is most meaningful <clears throat> to figure out what is the proportion of people having difficulty sleeping for just those in this less than 40 group. So that tells me that I would want to figure out what 64 is um, divided by then the column total. So essentially what I want is column percents. And so when R uh, references anything, you know, it starts with the rows and then it goes with the columns. So margin is just a way for me to tell it, okay, use the second margin. First margin would be the row totals. Second margin is the column totals. So we want margin equals two to give us column, um, column percentages. Uh, and then I could keep these as percentages if I want, excuse me, proportions if I wanted to. I could just go ahead and multiply all of the numbers in this proportions table by 100. Oops, let's undo that. By 100, and then what I get is percentages. So I certainly could do that as well just to um, look at things. So we'll go ahead and run this column uh dot PCT column percentages and we'll run the name and so all of those counts now have been converted into percentages. So here's the key uh, just to make sure that I've done it correctly. Notice that these two numbers in the column should add up to about a hundred percent give or take a little bit of rounding error. Um, same here. So these two numbers should add up to a hundred percent. And so it looks like even though the counts are pretty different, I mean, 64 to 101, the sample size for each group is different. So it's not really fair to compare the 64 to the 101. Instead, what we can do is compare percentages or proportions. Okay. All right. Um, this other one, just real quick, if uh, these are too many decimal places, that's a lot of decimal places and I don't want to have to think about rounding them myself, I can always round this table. We just, I named it round dot column percentages and I want to round it to the, whatever number is in here, I want to round it to the second decimal place. So if I use this, I'll just type in the name of our percentage table col.pct, I enter that, 
And then the next argument is just how many decimal places do I want it to be rounded to? And that just cleans things up a little bit. Makes me not have to think quite so much when it comes to um, rounding some of those numbers. Okay, so a graphical display that I can use for this problem is a bar plot still, um, but it's going to be a bar plot that uh, uses the um, the two by two table, so it's considered a side by side bar plot, and you'll see what it looks like. Now remember, one strategy that I use just so I can kind of see what I'm staring at is I just do a quick graph with no frills, again, so I can kind of see what I'm working with. So let's go ahead and create a super simple bar plot, and I'm just gonna use those rounded percentages. So I'm gonna use this table that I created. I easily could have used this table, not a big deal. And in fact, I could even do a bar plot where I'm looking at counts. But remember I said it's not really fair to compare counts when the sample sizes are so different. Instead, it's a little bit nicer to compare proportions or percentages if I'm just doing a direct comparison. So we'll go ahead and type in uh, the name of our rounded table of percentages. And I'll run that. And again, this is just a quick and dirty um, bar plot. So see what I get here. Okay, because my data set contained names for the categories, I don't have to mess with changing the names. But I do have this, what is called a segmented bar plot. Personally, I find this kind of hard to read um, because this whole column will add up to 100%. This gray, I know, represents the almost 6% of the group. Therefore, the, um, the other part of this bar is about, what, 93%, whatever that number was. That I just find this graph very difficult to read. So I want these bars to not be within the same area. I want them to be side by side. Therefore, the name side by side bar plot. Okay, um, so I need an argument to fix that, but um, everything else, you know, doesn't look so bad. So what I'll do now is I will use this kind of pre-written bar plot function, and I'll explain all of these arguments here. Okay, so first things first, provide it a table. Next, I want to, you know, liven this up a little bit with some color. And so we'll go ahead and type in red and light blue for the two colors that we're going to um, use. Since I have another category being shown, right, which is difficulty, I do want a legend to be provided um, so that I know, okay, what is this dark gray? Um, represent, or in other words, what does the um, red represent, and then what does the light blue represent. So that's where I'm going to say legend equals true, and we'll just go ahead and use the default legend that uh, R will create for us. All right, and then we have nice labels for our axes. In order to uh, create a nice uh, spot for our legend, we're going to increase the Y limit. So since I have percentages here, the percentages go from 0 to 100%, but I want to create more space so that I can actually put a legend, so I'm going to increase it to 140. Again, that just gives me some white space up here. And um, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, we are going to turn off the Y axis. Right, because it would be a little bit weird if I had the y-axis, which is percentages, um, to you know go all the way up to 140. I still want the y-axis to stop at 100, so I'm going to turn it off, right? And I'm also then going to rewrite it a little bit, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. And then finally, the argument that allows me to have these bars side by side instead of all within one bar is this argument here besides equal or beside equals true. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we've got. So I'm going to put my cursor up here in line 96. You can either highlight everything or just leave it up here at the top. Hit run and there we have it. So notice that the 
um, Y axis is gone, right? Because I turned it off with this argument right here, but I want to rewrite it and I just want to make sure that it goes from zero to 100. Axis, first argument um, for this axis uh, function is what axis am I rewriting? One is the X axis, two is the Y axis. So that's why I typed in a two. And then at, we're going to have tick marks, right? Because tick marks equals true is back here. So we're going to have tick marks only at 20 or 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. And then the labels will go ahead and add true. So anyway, these are the things that we need to rewrite our Y axis where I don't then have the Y axis going up to 140. So again, just some, you know, cosmetic things that I'm doing to make this look just a little bit nicer. All right, so here we have two sets of bars, one for the less than, uh, less than 40, and then here's the over 40. Uh, red represents those that have difficulty sleeping Blue represents those that do not have difficulty sleeping. And notice how these, the relationship between these two bars is similar to the relationship of these two bars. Yeah, that kind of implies that we don't have much difference between the groups now, doesn't it? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I don't know that we're going to get very much evidence to reject the null hypothesis. But let's go ahead and find that out exactly. So today what we're going to use is the prop.test. Now, technically, this actually performs a chi-squared test for us, which is a subject that we're going to get into. Um, but there's a relationship between the chi-squared test and the z-test for proportions. Um, if I can do a z-test for proportions, I can actually do a chi-squared test, right? Test of association. Um, because a chi-squared test for a two-by-two -two table um, a chi-squared statistic is really just a z statistic squared. Yeah, can you believe it? Now granted I haven't gotten into chi-squared tests just yet, but um, this is a function that is going to essentially give us the same p-value. So even though it's performing a chi-squared test, um, it's going to give me the same p-value as if I went ahead and just did that uh, z the two sample Z test for proportions that was discussed in lecture. Okay, so first argument here in this prop.test, I need to give it the X's. So the number of successes for in this spot would be group one and this spot would be group two. So again, my X, I need to provide it two different counts. So uh, in our uh, example, uh, we had for the no, or I'm sorry, for the difficulty group, there was 64 successes. And for the um, working over 40 hours group, 101 successes. So I'll show you up in the table of counts where this is at. So I'm going to use, and again, we need to input counts. So I'm going back to the sleep table. And then I'm providing it the um, number of successes, right? Because we're good, again, defining difficulty sleeping. That was our success. And then it's for the first group and then for the second group. Okay. Then I have to provide it the sample sizes for each group. So the sample size for the less than 40, uh, well, um, I don't have it exactly. So... I could, let's see, just do 64 plus 888, right? Because that would be the sample size for this first group. Now, I like my code to be a little cleaner than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just find out what are those sample sizes. So I'm going to use R like a calculator. I'm just going to figure out what is that sample size. So 64 plus 888. That is 952, so that's going to go in that spot. Okay, and then I need to figure out what is the sample size for our second group. So I go back up to my table of counts. 101 plus 3, nope, 1396, 
hit run. Oops, wrong spot there. <sighs> what am I doing? Typing too many buttons. Okay, so here is our sample size for the second group. One, four, nine, seven. Okay, our alternative was less than because remember we believe that the proportion of those having difficulty sleeping is less in the less than 40 hour group compared to the overworked individuals. Uh, confidence level is going to be 0.95 and then um, correct equals true just provides a little bit of a correction because we are in uh, using counts here. It's a continuity correction. Okay, so running this prop.test function, we get some output. Let me explain what we are looking at. So um, we get a summary of the data that we put into it. And the x squared, that's really supposed to be a chi-squared test uh, statistic, is super, super little which would also imply our Z statistic, if we were to calculate a two sample Z test, our Z statistic would be super little. And therefore a P value is 0.5. That's gigantic, it's huge. Remember when the P value is large, there is no evidence to support the alternative. In other words, we have failed to reject the null. There is no evidence to suggest that the proportion of individuals having difficulty sleeping is different between those that work 40 hours or less and those that work over 40 hours. All right, there's just no evidence of a difference. That's all we've got. All right, everyone. Well, I will, I think, leave that here. Um, I hope uh, this has helped answer some of your questions about how to perform proportion problems in R. All right, have a good day, everyone. Take care.